Let's turn in our Bibles to Numbers chapter 4. I want to draw your attention to Numbers chapter 4, verses 28 through 33. And I want to speak to you this morning on the little things of life that really make a difference, those little tiny things that sometimes we think that really don't, but they do. In other words, you might say something negative to your children that could really affect them for a life. Or you might say something really positive to a person and they could change their destiny for a life. Believe it or not, words have that ability to do that. You can encourage or you can destroy. You can build or you can tear down. And this is what we have to come to grips with. Or we can almost get something done, but not get something done. In other words, there are all kinds of projects we've started and haven't finished them. And oftentimes, it's that last 10% we kind of give up on, thinking it's not really important. But it is, because you look at it, I look at it, your wife looks at it, and it's not done. Maybe the last two doors in your house have not had the molding put on. And I understand the justification. By the time you take out all the tools and all the time to do it and the nail guns and everything else, it's a hassle. But here's your option. Mess it up for one day, have it done, and have your wife really happy or don't do it and hear about it for the rest of your life. And so I just think it makes a lot of sense to get things done. The same thing happens when all of a sudden we realize that we don't follow through with projects. And when we understand that, it's important. So here's what I want to teach you this morning. Little things like a thank you, God bless you, little things that you do really make a difference. And who do they make a difference with? God. And when God sees you faithful in the small things, then He makes you rulers over many things. And the Bible says don't despise the day of the small things. And so we do forget those small things, and yet I believe that when a person focuses on the small things of his life, it speaks about character and integrity within his life. I think it takes more integrity and more character to get those small things done than the big things. Because anybody can do a big thing. But it's those little tiny things you do day in and day out. And so we find in here, in chapters 3 and 4 of the book of Numbers, let me give you a little bit of background, there were a couple families that were taking place. Number one was, of course, Moses and Aaron and Miriam. They were brothers and sisters. Aaron was now the priest, and we know that. And Aaron had four sons. Two of them were killed by God there inside the temple. It was, you remember, uh, the one Nadad and Abihu. They offered strange fire to the Lord, and God took their lives because we believe possibly they were drunk and not doing according to what God wanted. They blew every single violation that they could of the way that God said to do it. So God said to Aaron, do not weep for your children. If you do, I'm going to deal with you. In other words, they were wrong, and God was right. And God did not want Aaron to express himself except to acknowledge God. Aaron, you made the mistake. You did not teach them right, and therefore your sons are gone. Now you have two more, Ithamar and once again Eliezer. Those two now become part of the priesthood. Then the second group you have in chapter 3 and 4 is a family of Levite. Now why is that important? Because Levite had three sons, and one we find out was named um, Kohath, and the other one was Gershom, and then Miriam. In other words, there were four, three sons, and they were responsible for breaking down the ark, picking up the ark, taking things away, and setting it back up. So in that three families, two had great responsibility. One was able to take the ark of the covenant, the gold ark of the covenant, the golden incense, and the golden bread, and uh, the table, I should say, and also the brazen altar. The second family took the curtains, the pillars, and all the things that would stick out. And the third family is what I want to speak to you about, is they picked up the rings and the ropes and the instruments and things that no one would even think about looking at. And I think that's what life is all about. Hey, look at what he has. Look at what he has. And this is what God's given to you, but it's not good enough. And so we never are responsible for what God has given to us. And it's very important to understand that. And here's the bottom line. If you're going to be part of the team of worship with Aaron and once again with uh, Levite, it says that every one of them had to be counted, everyone had to serve, and everyone had to fill a burden. 
But here's the other option. If you were not part of that family, then you were part of another family. You were part of the soldiers. And so everyone from the age of 20 to 50 had to be in the army, had to register. And so everyone outside of that family had to be in war. So guess what? You had to be counted, you had to serve, and you had to hold your ground. So here's what God's really saying. Every one of us in this room have been called by God to do something, to be a servant somewhere in our life. There's no way we can get out of it unless we're going to sin. And so it tells us in Numbers chapter 4, verse 28, this is the service of the families of the sons of Gershom and the tabernacle of the congregation. Their charge shall be under the hand of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, which only is saying there's accountability on their end. As for the sons of uh, Marah, thou shalt number uh, them the after the families by the name of the fathers, from thirty years upward to fifty years old shall thou be numbered. Everyone that entereth into the service to be do the work of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now, verse 31 and 32 is what I want to focus in. This is the charge of their burden. So what God is saying, you're going to have a burden in life, and this is what you have to do, according to all their service in the tabernacle of the congregation. The boards of the tabernacle, the bars, the pillars thereof and thereof, the pillars of the court round about, their sockets and the pins, and the cords with all their instruments. In other words, this is what they had to do. So you could say, this is a drag, or you can say, this is God's will. Whatever I do in word or deed, I need to do it for the glory of God. And let me give you a couple of examples. God is into the small things because it reveals where the heart really is. There was a boy, you remember, in the New Testament. He gave a sack lunch, and Jesus was able to feed 5,000 adults, which we believe about 10,000 people were fed when you had the kids and wives. And so here was a boy that had a little sack lunch, a little lunch that he gave it to Jesus. And Jesus was able to feed a multitude of people. Was that important? Absolutely. So that tells me that little things touched by God can become supernaturally huge in your life. Ministry can be explosive but you've got to do the small things. You can't walk over people. And secondly, we find a woman. Do you remember her name was Dorcas or Tabitha, whichever you want? And she was known for sewing up clothes. In other words, their clothes would fall off, she would sew them. And she had a great ministry of sewing clothes. One day she died. And guess what? There was no one to sew clothes. So they raised her from the dead. This is an unbelievable story. And they, I imagine she got back up. She goes, what are you doing? Well, we need you to kind of sew. Our pants are falling off. We're falling apart. We need your needle. We don't, you don't have time to die right now. You have been called by God to use that little tiny needle and help us out. So they raised her from the dead, gave her back her needle, and guess what she did? She kept sewing. And so God took a needle and kept sewing. And then we find that there was a man with a rod. His name was Moses. And God said one day to him, what's in your hand? He said, a rod. God said, throw it down. And it turned into a serpent. He said, pick it up. And all of a sudden, God declared, by this rod, I will destroy your enemies. And by this rod, I'm going to open the Red Sea. And with this rod, I'm going to bring your enemy floating back to you, and you're going to see him dead. And by this rod, I'm going to open up the area, and Korah is going to fall into it. And by this rod, I'm going to open up a Red Sea. In other words, Moses thought, it's just a rod, but in my hands, Moses, it's everything. You see, if you would have never given the rod, that stuff would have never happened. So God's not asking you to give him what you don't have. He's only asking you to give what you do have. Maybe your attitude needs to be given to God. Or maybe something else needs to be given to God. Or your insecurity needs to be given to God. Well, why? Because God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. And God wants to heal you. And God wants to do a great work. But if you don't give it to Him, it's not going to work. So what is God asking you for right now? For you to trust more? Then start doing that. And then we remember there was a captain that wanted to be healed of leprosy, Naaman. And all of a sudden, he would not go into the Jordan. He thought it was foolish. 
A little girl said, what's the problem? If it works, it works. And so he baptized himself seven times. He was healed. A little thing of obedience, and God took away a major disease. If I said to you, listen, you have cancer? Go down to Gabriel Beach and dip yourself seven times. I forget it. It's incurable. Well, you're never going to know until you do it. If you would do it and be absolutely pure, would you do it? Is it stupid? No, if it works. In other words, how many things do we give up because we don't tune in? Maybe a kid talking to us, we don't have time. You better make time. If you don't have time for that child, at three years old bugging you in the kitchen, at 13 years old, that child's not going to talk to you. If you don't have time to put your Bible down and put your TV down and go play ball with your son, when you want your son to come home, he's not going to come home. You have to find time and figure out what's important in your life. The little things. Now, to my wife, turn off the TV when the NFL's playing, the Super Bowl, and four minutes are left, and it's tied. Now, I don't know why she does it. I, just, I can't figure this thing out, but I turn it off. And when she's done, the game's over. It's just like, but the bottom line is I don't want to sleep on the couch. And those guys I'm watching won't give me no money. And I can't sleep with them, so, you know, turn it off. It's not worth it. But when it comes down, it's about flesh and blood. What's more important? This is all fantasy. This is the real thing. I don't know if she's texting me, but... She doesn't have any idea, but it's almost like if God brings her in at the wrong moment. Now, does God do that? No. Is God testing her or me? No doubt, me. And what's more important, what she has to say or this game? Well, I don't watch football that much anymore, but, you know, it's an amazing thing what happens sometimes. And then there's a teenager with a sling said to David and Goliath, Goliath, you're coming down, but all you have is a sling. No, in the hand of God, God will guide the rock. God will strengthen the rock. God will make that rock go into his skull, and God will drop that guy. doesn't make a difference. It's not David. It's God. And lastly, there was a widow with a barrel, just a widow with a barrel with a dying child. And Elijah said, if you feed me, I'll make sure you have enough for the whole famine. And sure enough, she believed. And so she fed Elijah, and there was oil for the whole famine. So tell me what little things are not important. When Elijah was praying, there was a little cloud. It turned into a huge storm. And he told Ahab, there's a storm coming. And we find the very same thing happening over and over again. In the day of small things, don't despise it. Never despise those small things in your life. So I want to share six things with you this morning that might really help you in a great way. I want you to kind of pretend with me that we're going on a journey and we're going to take your car. And I'm going to say to you, let's check it out. Let's make sure your car is going to make it. You're laughing because your car barely made it to church. But let's just say we're going to go all the way to, you know, the mountains and back. Well, we're going to take Pastor Steve. Is it going to make it? I hope so. Well, what are we going to do? We're going to check some very basic things out. You say, that's ridiculous. That's what I'm talking about. You have a new car, haven't checked out the oil. Now you blew your engine. Now whose fault's that? You. You blew it. Who... They don't come and help you. They don't do that. The gas station doesn't help you. Wives, you've got to learn how to do it. You have to take care of it yourself. If it's your car, you've got to take care of it. So a little dipstick, wipe it off, stick it in. Oh, I don't want to do that. My husband, what happens if your husband's traveling? Well, then your engine blows up. No, we've got to understand this little stuff. Very important. Number one, a little thing like adjusting your lights. Maybe you have a car going down the street. One light on the left is blinding people coming this way, and one is shooting up in the air, waking up the neighbors going down the street. Now, to you, it's not important, but the neighbors are kind of bummed out because you're always waking them up. And the person on the other side is always almost getting in an accident. Now, if I went in and saw it, I'd be able to fix it, make sure that's right on the asphalt, and I'd be safe. And you say, well, why is that so important? Because you are to be the light of the world. It says here in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, ye are the light of the world. Not maybe, you are the light of the world. You're a city that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. Your life is not to be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it underneath a bushel. But a candlestick, it gives light 
to all that are in, check it out, the house. Remember that word house. Least, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father. Two things that are so important. Number one, when people in my home are looking at my life, do they see the light of Jesus Christ? In other words, does my wife see Jesus Christ? When my children come over, are they able to see the light of Christ? Or do they see someone who's anxious and uptight and overwhelmed and mad? Secondly, am I bringing favor to God? In other words, when all of a sudden my son sees my light, and all of a sudden he sees the light and sees what I'm doing, does he thank God for my life, for what I used to be and what I am today? Two important things. You say, well, what is this headlight all about? Why do I need to adjust my life? Because you are the light of the world. And like it or not, you're affecting people in your home. If you have no light, it's not light in the right way, you're in the darkness rather than light, your wife is going to be upset. Your children are going to be scared. Your wife's not going to know what to do with you because she thinks you're backslidden. You think you're okay, but you're not. You know you're not okay. And things aren't together. You're not coming to church together, not hanging out together, not praying together, not talking. Things are not going well. You don't want to leave each other, but it's a mess. Same thing in dating. Why even date anymore? But when you have the light and you begin to focus in, get things together, and now you really are the light, then all of a sudden your light is all over the place. And someone who sees you, they have great confidence in your life. And when they see you, they begin to glorify God. When I get up and help Gail with the dishes, I know in her heart she's thanking God for what I'm doing. She's been praying that God would humble me, but now she sees it. So when I'm doing things that she knows I wouldn't do, when I ask directions and all these other things that humble a guy, she is able to say, God, thank you for this man that I have, that he's willing to ask directions, not be prideful, and get us lost. In other words, that's what happens. So on a scale of 1 to 10... Are your lights here, or are you lighting up the neighbors and getting people in a wreck? Is your life all over the place, or are you focused in your home, and do the kids see it? You are the light of the world. The second thing I think is really important, a little light, sometimes you need to adjust the timing of your car. Now, you don't understand what that is, a lot of people, but in every car, there's a timing belt, and you have to adjust that timing belt with a scope. And you get those lines just perfect and the distributor. And everything now begins to run smooth. All of a sudden, the pistons are firing. Everything's happening right. Nothing's backfiring. But let me take the other way around. Let's move that thing out of order about a quarter of an inch. What happens? Pistons don't run. You begin to blow smoke. And all of a sudden, you begin to backfire. And it is so loud, it sounds like a gun's going off. And people are falling down around you in L.A. thinking someone's shooting them. So now that's the effect you have. So here, are you setting the timing? In other words, are you having devotions with God? If you have devotions with God, you're going to be in harmony with God. You're not going to be like Jonah, running away, causing all kinds of problems. You're going to be like Habakkuk, in prayer, and your kids are going to see it, your friends are going to see it, and they're going to see somebody in harmony, able to keep up in speed, able to run, able to start the car. You can't even start the car sometimes if it's that bad out of tune. So if my life is out of tune, I'm not walking with God, I can't start the car. If I do, I'm going to backfire it. Smoke's going to come out, and it's going to run like really weird because it should be running this way. It's going to be jumping all over the place, and instead of running on eight cylinders, I run on two. I don't go anywhere. And sometimes that's what happens in our life. So tell me, on a scale of 1 to 10, are you backfiring, blowing smoke, out of, out of sync, or do you feel like everything is perfect in harmony with God? My life is being tuned in. And so now I'm focused. I realize what God's called me to do. And so I come in and God adjusts my life. In Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed, oh, how happy is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. So I don't want to go there. Nor stands in the way of sinners. Don't want to go there. Nor sets in the seat of the scornful. In other words, that's out of timing. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. There it is. I have an option. 
God, let me be in your word day and night, and now I'm going to make great decisions in my life. So my life might get more busier. I need to spend more time. I might get an extra kid. I need to spend more time. I might be a supervisor. I need to spend more time. As your life goes up, you need to spend more time because, again, if you don't come away, you're going to fall apart. So if you begin to backfire, you begin to blow smoke, you begin to bark and make large noises, then you ought to check things out. You might be out of tune. Number three, I like this one probably the best. Little things like adjust, once again, your brakes. Just adjust the brakes. Well, if you live in the hill, you're going to come down. And if you listen to people that come down the hill, they're on rivets. They've gone through the pad. They've gone through the rivets. They're now destroying the brake drum. And all of a sudden, it's hard to stop. So you have a family. You barely can stop. You go through a stop sign, you get in a wreck. You kill a bunch of people. You can't stop what you're doing. And this is what I think is so important. What happened? Well, you know, I keep hitting the brakes and keep hitting the brakes, and I'm not using my gears. I wore out my brakes. I can't stop. Well, here's what I think it means. It says here, very simply, in James chapter 1, verse 25, But whosoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetter of the hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridles not his tongue, I think this is what he's saying. Can you stop your mouth? <laughs> well, I don't know. Are you gossiping? Well, yes. Can you stop? I don't know. Can you stop thinking for a moment? I don't think so. Can you stop your emotions for a moment? I don't think so. You have to. Because your emotions are destroying things. Your mind is all over the place. And all of a sudden, you are talking so much, you can't hear God. Can you stop? Well, you say that to a woman, and it's like, no, no, I can't. I just got to gotta clean the closet. I got to clean the kitchen. I got to clean this. I got to clean that. Stop. Yeah, just can't. You have to. If you don't, you're not going to hear God. What did God say to Moses? Stand still and see the salvation of God. Moses, you're all over the place. Stand still and watch me work. Well, God, that'd be kind of cool. What did he say to David? Be still. In other words, quit talking, and I'm going to speak to you, but I can't get through because all you're doing is talking. And what did Naomi say to Ruth? Set still till Boaz has done his work. In other words, Ruth, you're pacing back and forth, driving me crazy. Sit down, woman. Just sit down. Why? Because Boaz has to do it, honey. You can't. So you set yourself here and relax. But don't go back and forth. And Moses, you're down in your face. Stand up and watch me work. And David, be quiet so you can hear what I'm trying to tell you. Stop. And there's nothing better than going down the street and stopping. Someone cuts in front of you, you can stop. And sometimes you think, no, no, I got good breaks. And all of a sudden, you get someone killed. We destroy things because we can't stop. You shouldn't be talking that way, and you keep on talking that way. Shouldn't be thinking that way, but your mind's going crazy. Women, you do that sometimes. You just think, 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 think. Guys, we look, 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 look. Guys, stop looking. Women, stop Blowing things out of a portion. Bring it back. Stop. Take a step back and say, God, you speak to me. You help me. And then number four, little things like adjusting your steering. I think this is so cool. We live today where people are not fixing the potholes. You finally get your car running, and you hit a pothole, and your steering's like this. You know what I'm talking about, some of you? So you see them going down the street like this. Their steering's like this. And they're, they're, and they're not having a good time. I'm going down the street like this, one hand on a wheel, just smooth, until I hit a pothole. Then I'm doing this. And yet I look and I realize, you know, God, I need to adjust my steering, and here's why. Because I'm here and I'm here. I'm running over this pedestrian. I'm running in this car. My car is all over the place. I have a car that goes beep, beep, beep when I cross a white line. It's a, 19, it's a 206, 2006, and if I cross this white line, it goes off. Beep, beep, beep. And my wife says, what is that noise? I said, it's a defect, honey. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, it's actually I'm over the white line. So it's just a guy trying to get down the road, staying between the white line. Well, I'm having a hard time. Well, check it out. In Proverbs 3, verse 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart 
and lean not to your own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Be not wise in thy own eyes, but fear the Lord and depart from evil. That's a great verse in Proverbs 3, verse 5. In other words, I'm going this way, but the fear of God brought me back. I'm going this way in evil, but God's goodness brought me back. I need to adjust my steering because it's getting off. I'm chasing this gal, but she's not a believer. I'm going in business with this non-believer. It's not God's will. Come back right down the straight line. So, number one. God, I want to talk to you about my light. Am I really a light here at this church? Or am I just shining everywhere I shouldn't be? And second, God, am I really able to stop and not be so aggressive and listen to criticism? And Lord, is it possible that I could just once again go down the street and stay faithful to the call you've done in my heart? And then number five, a little thing like, your radiator. Well, maybe you want to go to the mountains. You think, well, what's up? Let's go. Well, have you put radiator into your radiator? Have you put antifreeze into your radiator? No. Okay. Well, you got mountains, it's snowing. Guess what? You get up in the morning, try to start your car, it's frozen. Your block is frozen. You just, you probably cracked your block because ice expands and many people crack their blocks and it's over. I have to buy a brand new engine. Well, what happened? You didn't keep your heart warm. If I would have put that antifreeze in the radiator, if I would have maintained my heart and kept it tender, if I would not allow my heart to be cold or nasty, I wouldn't have shot that person, I wouldn't have divorced that woman, and I wouldn't say what I'm saying to my kids right now. So is your heart a little off? On a scale of 1 to 10, would you say that your heart is closer to God or closer to criticism? So, God, I need a warm heart. So, God, fill my heart. And so we read in a very profound way in Matthew, Mark chapter 12, verse 30, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. God, keep my heart tender. God, help me to maintain the water through the system Help me to make sure that I have everything I need so my heart never goes cold. And the Bible says in the last days, men's hearts are going to go cold. And men's heart are going to fail them, but not my heart. It's going to stay on fire for Jesus Christ. So do I have a car that my lights are tuned in? My steering is going straight? My brakes are working? And my radiator and everything else is warm and good? Or do I have a life that's out of control and my heart is cold, and I'm steering over and running over people, and, you know, I'm just out of control. And then lastly, little things like adjust your direction. Probably guys, I probably have to speak here to you guys. Adjust your directions. In other words, you have to change your attitude. Are you lost? Yeah. Can you say that? No. So now you've been driving for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Your wife says, Honey, do you know where you're going? Well, yeah, I do. Well, honey, the woman in the box, she said make a right turn. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Well, honey, isn't that hooked up to the satellite? That's looking down at all the streets and knows all the names. Do you, do you, honey, I put that little box on my car, and she don't know what she's talking about. I've been here a lot of times in my life. And I'm looking for landmarks like the Shell gas station. Well, there's all kinds of Shell gas stations. Which one? And so you argue with her and get mad. And so you shut off the box. That's real smart. And I, it's, I, it's right here. I know it. And you finally get so flustered. You pull in and you get directions and you are in the wrong city. I mean, you're really lost. Remember the joke I kind of tell you about the nativity scene? That the wise men left, but they didn't get to Jesus for two years later? See, it, it would have been women. They would have found him right away. But the wise men, they didn't get directions. You know, they just kind of went with the star. We, just, we don't need anything else. Well, that's what we do. We're prideful. Well, if I'm not willing to adjust my attitude, and check this verse out, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. That's all we have to talk about. In other words, do I really believe these little things are important? Like 
a hug or a kiss before I leave or a prayer, or if I'm dating, being polite and nice, or if I'm hanging out with the kids, do you want to play ball? The little things that sometimes bug me, but I know will bless them. And when has it ever happened in my life that who cares about them? It's me. Well, when I say no, I usually end up saying yes. Because if I just go the opposite of how I feel, I'm probably pretty much close to Christ. When I know that Gail wants to sit down and go over our calendar, I hate it. But if it makes her happy, why wouldn't I want to do something like that? You see? So what I do is I fight this thing. And so now she's upset. She doesn't see the light. We're not organized. We're fighting. We're hitting dips. Steering's out of control. And all of a sudden, you find yourself lost. Is that what you want? Or how about this? If she needs it, hey, I'll do it. If I need it, she'll do it. Simple. It's so simple. How about this? God wants your whole heart. Okay, you can have it. Not 90%, the whole thing. How about go home and finish the garage? How about go home and finish your projects? How about go home and finish that conversation we're going to have that you never did? How about we just do that? And you know what's going to happen? God's going to adjust your life, and you're going to change, and people are going to look up to you, and God will take you from where you are to be a foreman, to be an owner all the way up, because God will use those types of people. If you are concerned about the little things in life, that is the integrity, that is the character that you have to go after.